could you start at the beginning and introduce yourself and tell everyone who you are and how we got here? Sure. Uh, my name is Robin Carneen, and thank you so much for including me in this project that you're working on. And I am sitting on the Swinomish Indian Reservation in Lakana, Washington, which is my tribal affiliation. I'm an enrolled tribal member, and I've been here about 16 years. I was originally from Northern California, which is where my Swinomish grandmother um, relocated to under a government uh, program that was supposed to make her life better, and it did not. Unfortunately, she ended up in San Francisco, and she died about a year before I was born, and um, we've been looking for our tribe ever since, and all my mom knew what my grandma Margie Williams told her is all she can remember is it had ish in, in the name of the tribe. So we had no idea there were 29 tribes up here in Washington State. All, all I ever heard about was Skokomish. That was the only one that I really knew about, you know, and as far as like being exposed to it in school. We never studied, you know, the tribes up this way. So through radio, the magic of radio and my path of being a, a journalist, and a radio show host and producer, I found my way home. And um, it was mainly because of Ray Freiberg, who I interviewed from Tulela. And I was interested in him because we were just friends on the internet. It was through, uh, there was a program called ICQ. It was kind of like Facebook, you know, so there was like thousands of chat rooms that you could uh -huh join up and you know talk and socialize with each other and uh, a roommate of mine at the time in northern california he introduced me to being on a computer i thought i'd never touch one in my life i was a big outdoor park ranger kind of person i thought oh i don't need i don't need that stuff you know um anyway my roommate randy introduced me to the internet and ICQ and I just randomly picked a room and Ray Freiberg happened to be the host of it. So for five years, um, we were friends and he told me they were going overseas to dance with their um, dance group, a beautiful dance group that they have. And so I interviewed him about that and we just stayed friends. And then my mom ended up moving from Oregon to live with me and my boys at one point and she was trying to get on uh, disability. And so you have to have all this paperwork. And she happened to have Margie's birth certificate that I had never seen before. And I looked at it and I'm like, Lakata, Washington. I like, I'm gonna ask Ray how far that is from his reservation. Maybe there's, maybe there's a clue there because my mom had been doing genealogy as well. So I got a hold of Ray right away and he said, well, cousin, he said, there's a reservation there called Swinomish, and I'm going to make some phone calls. So he called the enrollment officer, who was Lona Wilbur at the time, and next thing you know, our phone was ringing off the hook. We had Lona calling, we had cousins calling, and they'd been looking for my mom and, you know, her, her brother. She had a brother that was, you know, that's another story, but they, you know, the tribe had been looking for Margie and, and her children, and they didn't know that Margie had passed away. So they were really glad to get that information, you know, kind of closure for them. But then they opened the door for us to come up and, and become enrolled. So I was at a point in my life that I was, I wanted to actually move to Alaska at that point. Um, there was a radio station out of Anchorage that I was really interested in, but when this door opened, I thought all I've ever wanted to do was know my tribe, know my people, know my culture, and all the things I'm doing here in California, I can carry those up and help my own tribe, you know, as far as, you know, talking about Native Americans and our rights and the environment and all of those things. So I ended up moving up here 16 years ago uh, and doing radio at the college, at KSVR College for about four years. And then I got into online radio for different reasons. I ended up doing online radio as well. I was doing, I was doing both at the time. So that's my, my short story of a very long story, but a very wonderful story about getting to come home 
and uh, you know, here I'm wearing a cedar headband, you know, that I made and, you know, never did I realize that this would be a dream that came true for me and my mom. My brothers enrolled, my brother Scott's enrolled, my children are descendants, my two boys, and my baby sister, my other sister are also, you know, descendants. And if they ever move up this way, then we're hoping that they can get enrolled as well. We're very active in our culture. We're bringing back our language. We even have a little college here, Northwest Indian College, a uh, very good gardening program, which really took off like crazy during the pandemic. So everybody really got into gardening. Uh, and I'm thinking about getting back into radio. I had to take a little bit of a break because of some health issues, but I'm getting well and I'm fired up. I listened to an old radio show that I did about climate change and global warming. And that's why you and I are talking today specifically about that topic because that was 12 years ago that I did that show and I really want to you know come back into that circle into that talking circle again because now we have so many uh, bad fallout you know from global warming and I really wish that people you know could have got on board faster you know it's like my gosh 12 years went by like a flash and now not only are we suffering really bad flooding, worse than normal, we're also suffering all these bad fires that we're, ha you know, that we're having in Colorado, Oregon, Northern California, Washington State. And that can, I'm telling you, goes directly back to climate change and global warming. So we're in real big trouble. And I'm really hoping that the people that you're talking to I like the ideas. I like the action that they're taking, you know, to especially up north where the icebergs are melting so fast, faster than anybody even counted on, you know, like I used to listen to other radio shows and they were like, Oh, not in our lifetime. You know, we're talking in another generation. Now it's like, Nope, it's here in our lifetime. This is happening. So that surprises you then that you had, done this work in 2012 and flash forward, here we are today. And I mean, what would you say? Not much has happened or our, our world leaders didn't get off the ball properly? I mean, what do you think happened? I just think there was a um, like disbelief. I think a lot of it was maybe, you know, the folks that are more for the oil companies and that, they don't want people to talk about this because then there's going to be bigger, you know, more uh, fighting that's going to go on, you know, for us to, you know, get away from oil production and go into solar and wind power and all of those things, you know, it's about big money a lot of the time. So I think there's that just trying to squash people, you know, and saying, you know, no, don't listen to that side, you know, that's not true. And, we need, we need, you know, our oil, we need our gas and all of those things. So I think there's that. But now those same people, it's like, it's in their face, what's happening, you know, we have to talk about it, it is scientific, you know, what's going on here. And um, I just think there's a lot of reasons that, you know, people weren't paying attention, you know, I mean, now during the COVID, we've all we're all stuck at home. And I think there's a lot more time, you know, to talk about this mm -hmm. and uh, do something about it. So I just think a lot of us have been really busy like that 12 years went by so fast. I was listening to that interview, just thinking of where I was in my life. And, you know, it, it just went by so fast. And I, during that time period, we weren't having this really bad wildfires in California. I think a lot of it is like, oh, this isn't going to happen to me. This isn't going to happen in my community, you know? And now it's like everyone is so shocked about what's going on. And now there's a scramble of how to problem solve around this right now. I mean, I don't think this is doomsday and this is like the end, the end, but I think we need to really make a big U-turn and go back to some old, practices like the indigenous people using fire in a very controlled way to control you know what was in the forest and 
you know, get with those people who know that knowledge still and bring those practices back because that could make a huge difference because I, you know, I worked for the park service for a long time and it was always about saving the trees, you know, saving the forest. And I can tell you, we were always underfunded. So we hardly had a maintenance crew. We didn't have like, like for the forest service, it was different. They actually did hire, you know, we had fire crews and we had trail cleanup crews and that sort of thing. But this is, we're talking heavy duty, cleaning of the forest we're not talking about just keeping a trail open you know mm-hmm. there is so much duff and other species in our forests that it's really compromised it's really compromised our whole environment and then you know a lot of people have some of these forested areas like right up against their private property so, you know, I think there's just an assumption that their house is never going to burn down, you know, if we're talking about the fires. And uh, now there's a huge wake-up call. Like, I, I'm listening to the videos and that, the, that sort of thing coming out of California, and I'm hearing the fire crews telling the private homeowner and the ranchers and stuff, you make sure you clear this much around your property, you know, just cut all that stuff away you know, don't do it on a day you're going to catch your lawnmower on fire. But if you can get to it, you need to make this big of a parameter. That kind of education should be going on all the time. It shouldn't be happening in a crisis. And that's the other thing that I think is a problem is there hasn't been this education and there hasn't been encouragement for people to take immediate responsibility, you know, for their own, you know, for their own little piece of real estate. So I think everyone's, everyone's going to do that now. Um, it's not as easy as Trump showing up and saying, hey, here's a rake. You know, that's not, that's not going to do it. I think when we were talking earlier, I'm like, we need the funding. We need to bring back like the California Conservation Corps, you know, and, and the state parks and other people that, that are the caretakers, you know, team up with these, you know, the, the Conservation Corps bring them onto those public lands and start to take care of that in, in a healthy way. Now, what do you think about this Alaska situation that we've been discussing with the village of Quinnahawk and they're having to move? So you, you mentioned uh, Quinault also, um, which had, had been, uh, I guess they'd begun moving their tribal center and some other facilities up to higher ground, but we were discussing earlier the idea that if you throw enough hardships in the path of a village and a people, that eventually that's going to consume the resources and the time. And you think about the move, like where would people be moving? One political judgment is, hey, move to the city, get an apartment like everybody else, right? But then you've got youth growing up and they're losing connection. You know, they're losing connection to the culture and, and, and the life ways. So can you just talk a little bit about that, about how you feel about that, what you see? Well, referring back to my introduction with my grandmother, you know, she was promised a better life. You know, she could pick whatever city she wanted to go live in. Um, and it was a disaster. You know, she moved off the reservation and she lost everything. She lost her language, she lost, you know, her relatives, her connection to her relatives uh, for 40, 40 years, 60 years, however long it took for my mom and I to come back. Um, It's not good. You know, I know they have to move because it's dangerous. You know, they're, they're going to get flooded. I understand that. But how do you preserve, you know, generation after generation after gener- hundreds of years of culture you know hundreds of years of of that connection you know to that land and to everything about it that's the part that worries me how do we preserve that like you know before it's flooded you you know you again it's going to take money it's going to take a commitment you know from the alaskan government you know, the cultural preservation people up there to make a, 
you know, just open up their pockets and say, okay, we're going to help you, you know, archive all of these things from your village. We're going to keep them in a safe place for you until you can build your own cultural center in your new location, you know, and then we will bring all of these things back to your community. It's going to take teamwork, you know, for them to hold on to that. It's going to happen. It's definitely going to happen that they're going to lose you know, their land base. So, and I think Quinault, you know, same thing for Quinault too. I'm hoping as part of that move that they get to have like a cultural center in their new location and that they, you know, still can um, preserve some of the things that were from the original place that their village was set up at. Cause I'm worried. Cause what happened to my grandma? It, it, there, she's just one story of a person that moved away, you know, nobody knew who she was in San Francisco. Like even growing up, like I was always looking around for somebody who looked like me, you know, people are always asking me if I was Japanese or Mexican or, you know, whatever. And I could never really answer them. I could just say I was native American, but I don't know what tribe I belong to. And we were, they were talking about like some people get dropped off of, uh, base roles after so many times like we were so lucky that we showed up when we did because we may never have known that we were Swinomish but I can tell you in my DNA since I've come home I know how to weave cedar I know how to paddle a canoe I loved hand drumming there was so many things in my life growing up that just started to sort of surface around me that I connected with even though I didn't know I was from you know, Washington State tribe, my DNA knew. So when I came home, I just had this big sense of deja vu. And so, you know, I, I really advocate for people who are looking for their roots, but I advocate also for people who are already here to hold on to what they have, you know, in, in any way, shape or form, you know, and go talk to their elders. What I was talking about with the village, um, the, the Aleutian village I was telling you about where I interviewed Larry McKirloff from up on the, the island that he was from, he was saying that the younger people were leaving because they were having to go further and further away to get sustenance, you know, to hunt the seals. And because it was just taking so long that a lot of the young people just gave up and did move to like Anchorage and did move to the cities you know, to try to make a living to help the people back in their village. And so that disconnect just is happening. You know, then the elders are passing away and all of those teachings are just going to disappear. And that's, that's the part that makes me sad. And so a piece of this is the global warming and the climate change. If that wasn't going on as fast as it was, I know nature is nature, but as fast as it's happening, I just hope that we have time, you know, to preserve some of these things before they disappear. And I'm really interested in the way that the intervention is happening and the remedies are, are happening. So I was really excited to hear about the mushrooms. I thought, wow, this is really wonderful. Everyone needs to know about this. This is, this is what I'm talking about, you know? Well, there are a lot of um, former, you know, military um, installations and, you know, fuel tanks, I mean, in, in every village almost, you know, and they were, I think, created, you know, during the Cold War, but in, in these times, you know, they supply fuel and energy for the villages themselves. <clears throat> so, um, so there's something really interesting happening because Quinnahawk is a little closer to the way we live in the lower 48 from what I hear. They're a little better connected and, and there's more travel back and forth between the village and the village families and things like that. Um, but, um, but all of these other villages that have these kind of cleanup problems, you know, it's very, it's very interesting. So Howard, Howard actually proposed to go into business with the village and say, you know, let's, let's do the, let's raise the mushrooms here, you know, and then you're closer to, to other uh, locations and so forth. So if they need cleanup, that becomes a tribal job, not, not just a job done by some outside company alone. Awesome. 
So, so when is that going to happen? Do you know? Do you guys have a timeline? Mm -hmm. Well, since everybody's under COVID, you know, we can't really have that conversation, but it came up from the, from the chairman. Wonderful. From the CEO of the corporation said, we can, we can take care of those mushrooms here. Great. So I, I was on that phone call. That was about three weeks ago. So we just okay. kind of rolled with it and said, you know, we we're, we gave him a proposal. Yeah. So this is what it would look like and this is how he would do it. And you know, that kind of thing. It's really logical, but, but it, it puts tribal communities in a position to not have to subcontract everything and to handle more um, in a, in a way that's, you know, connected to self-determination and sovereignty. You know, I don't, I don't know if the corporations are sovereign or what the relation between the corporation and the village is and where sovereignty rests, probably with the village, I guess, but uh, I haven't seen the legal stuff on that, so I don't know. But definitely, you know, that's a way to take more control of the world in which they live and, and do it the way they want to do it. Really, that's, that's really, really good. And it just creates that stewardship, you know, at that tribal level. That's what, you know, Swinomish is trying to do, you know, with the younger people too, and encouraging them to go to school and learn about it and, and all those things, and then come back to our, our uh, tribe and do that kind of work. We just got um, a new, well, it's, uh, it used to belong to Swinomish, but we have it back now. Um, there's a golf course, you know, that we own now. And on the edge of the golf course is a place where they're going to uh, reintroduce, I think it's clams. It's oh, okay. It was an oyster farm. Yeah. And so we're starting to do things like that. We, the state park, um, sold us kick it kick it island so that's a, an oh. island that's really important to us and so we're starting to do some work out there as far as like the vegetation and and a lot of studies going on and again that's a place that we could go harvest you know um other things that are part of our traditional diet so and that's that that piece right there there was a saying that I learned on canoe journey because as we travel um, along the journey, we stop at the different sites, the reservations and, and villages and such, and they feed us. And so one of the sayings was, you know, as when the tide goes out, the table is set. And I just thought that was so beautiful. And the, the thing that I worry about with the people who are having to move is I don't want them to lose that sustenance, that traditional food base that they have because we have such a high rate of diabetes. If we can eat like our ancestors ate, then our health problems will get less and less. We have a lot of people that have diabetes and some other nutrition related health issues. So it's really important that we keep that tie you know, to the places that we traditionally harvest and the foods that we traditionally harvest. So that's what I worry about with, with the, the villages losing that access and um, the availability of what has been traditional for them for generations. So this is where it gets connected. Because if you were sitting, you know, in a government office somewhere, and you looked at this, let's say, problem. You have a problem in Quinnahawk, some regulation crosses your desk. Um, is that an environmental problem or a human rights problem? Uh, it's both. And, and I say that because um, as far as human rights, there's treaty rights you know, as well, those are hand in hand. So as native human beings on the planet, it's, so, it's sad really that we have to have something, an agreement drawn up with the government that invaded us, that we have a certain right to go hunt and fish. And so, yeah, it, be, it becomes a human right, you know, and, and the environmental part of it, you know, I guess it, de it depends on which side of the fence you're on, you know, and what the intention is. So if you're the government and there's something 
you know, in this area that you want oil, for example, um, I don't know how hard certain factors in our government would work, you know, to protect the indigenous people, you know, because if the indigenous people go away, well, then the real estate and the resources are now re more readily available to our government. So, you know, sounds like conspiracy, but sometimes I wonder at the dragging of the feet that we've had, like I said, it's been 12 years since I had this conversation, you know, with the, with the people from Alaska that I did, you know, we've had both Republican and Democrats, you know, running the show within this time period. So, you know, I'm not sure how to answer that question. I think it depends on, on, you know, who has more uh, power and leverage, you know, I mean, indigenous people, we don't have a lot of money, you know, so if there's a corporate interest in the same area, we lose out most of the time. And sometimes we sell out as indigenous people because we don't have a lot of money and we're hungry and we need things just like other people in the world. You know, so there's like division that happens even within indigenous communities. So that that's that's a tough question, Robert. You know. Well, here's another way to look at it. Um, when we were talking with the Greenbelt Society about the environment of the Elwa, um, the point was made that the environment of the Elwa is the environment of the Elwa because of the people of the Elwa. And B and Adeline told me, oh yeah, they call this a park now, but it was always a park. We made it a park. So the Western world, you know, and the United States government has this idea and a lot of people here in this country have this idea. And it's even in the park service charter that they have to restore that land to pre-European contact state, right? So no one is telling the average person that this is a highly manicured, highly functional environment used by large communities of people, you know, for food and social and spiritual and uh, everything, you know? And so how can you separate this idea there's, there's an environmental something without a being a place where people have lived for 10,000 years or more. Going to Calistoga area when I was doing radio down there and there was a big concern about the geothermal drilling. And um, the, the person they assigned me to from the company, like we were driving around and he pointed out this little fenced off area and I'm like, oh, what's that? He goes, oh, that was a, that was a, a, a culturally sensitive area and so we made an agreement with the local tribe that we would protect it. So they put a little cyclone fence around it. You know, it's not marked or anything. And I, I was just like kind of shocked. And, you know, and then we kept going. And, you know, I, I, I had time with him. I really filled his ear with sort of an indigenous perspective about, because the issue was why well, I got involved as a native person is because they were doing ge geothermal drilling also in Mount Shasta area. And the, the WIOP people over there were protesting, you know, the geothermal drilling because they were doing it in their sacred area where they were going and collecting, like you were saying, the plant medicines and a, it was a place of prayer. But for the folks that were the, the corporate folks, that went sailing right over their head and, and they didn't care, you know, because they're not indigenous, you know, they don't go out and gather medicine. They don't go out and pray there. They just wanted to do the geothermal drilling and it was lucrative for them, you know, and they had the backing of some really big dollars and you hear these poor we out people, you know, they just had themselves, you know, to, to go out there. And, and so my radio show I wanted everybody to know about this, just like you guys want to know, you know, let people know about the mushroom cleanup that's happening up there is somehow we've got to get the word out and make it important to everybody. You know, like I understand why some people want geothermal drilling, you know, that's an option, but it can cause some other issues.
you know, it, it infringed upon the rights of the Wiyot people, for example. And then environmentally, there was concern it might be causing more earthquakes in that part of California. And even the geothermal people couldn't say yes or no. So I just think, you know, it's so hard. We're in different camps, I guess, if you want to call it that. And it's just like trying to bring everybody together and hear each other out, which is why I do radio. I let every side talk when there's an issue, you know, so that people can make informed decisions about what they want to believe in and what they want to, you know, respond to as far as a call to action. So we need to just keep getting the information out here somehow through your filmmaking, uh, radio, whatever it takes. You know, if this idea in Alaska, if it works and it employs people up there and it, and it helps slow down, you know, the, the climate change and the global warming, we need to get that out. We need to get that out to Washington, DC, to all those policymakers as well, because that's when all the money starts to flow the right direction. So, yeah. Yeah. And, but in the meantime, in the meantime, we're all worried, you know, if the tide goes out, you know, will our table, will our way of eating, will we still have access to that? Will it even still be there, you know, for us to utilize? Well, that's like the situation on the Elwha when they built the dam and they thought it was a really great idea. You know, Thomas Aldwell and the Chicago investors and everything. And they never thought that that would cut off the food supply for, you know, a few hundred people, probably. No. Under the radar, you know, for them, you know. Then they found they out about it and they kind of dodged it. Right. Yep. And then, and then Aldwell talked about surreptitiously buying property like he did it all sneaky in the first place to go put the dam in before people would realize what was going on. So they knew they were trying to get away with something in the beginning. And all, and all the history that was lost too, like that happened in California as well when they put up those dams and flooded all those areas, all those archeological sites, all of that knowledge underwater underwater i went up to um one of the, one of the neatest things i got to do was my cousin ray williams got us a tour to go up to um concrete up in that area there rockport mm -hmm. concrete and we went out on um we went out on the water there and we got to go to a place where our ancestors used to collect um shirt and stuff to make arrowheads and you know, I was in tears by the time we got there and we're standing there in this place. I just felt all my ancestors with me, you know, and as we were going over the, the lake, I was like, what's down there? And the tour guide was like telling me about all the trees and everything, you know, that are under that water now, like so much gets lost, you know, when those dams go in. So I'm glad they're starting to come down, you know, what, what your work you did to talk about that was really important. Thank you for acknowledging that. I was in, in the middle of something that was really large. You know how you get into a story and you kind of don't know which way it turns or how you turn it or am I influencing this correctly or did I use the right word? You know, yeah. It comes, comes down to that a lot. Yeah. Well, that area you have done a lot of work in is very significant. We were talking about the burial sites that they uncovered there you know, and, and, you know, what an eye opener. I, I think a lot of people, they talk about smallpox and, you know, a lot of how many thousands and thousands of Native Americans died because of that disease and because of yeah. murder and all kinds of stuff that happened to our people, you know, and to uncover something like that is huge. And spiritually, you know, for Lower Elwha to have to take that on as well, it's, it's, it's hard work, you know, to have that kind of discovery happen. And then to feel so lucky, you know, that we're still alive. You know, we've survived so much of the genocide and near genocide that's happened to us. So, you know, I think for me as a Native American person, it's so frustrating that our government 
has to negotiate with us all the time and give us permission, like I said, to hunt and fish and to practice our religion. You know, all of that is, is frustrating, you know, for me at this point, but that's a whole nother show. But I, um, you know, I just still want to be a voice. I still want to be at the table with all of this, you know, not just for myself, but for my kids and my grandkids, you know, they're inheriting this mess that we're in right now. I feel so bad for the kids right now, especially with COVID, you know, like even socially, their whole world is not, not the same and how confusing it must be, you know, for the children. Mm -hmm. So this is a good opportunity to talk with your kids about all kinds of things and uh, talk about disease control, talk about the environment, you know, really, you know, really discuss this with your kids. I know I did with my kids mm -hmm. growing up, but they had parents at the time that were both park rangers. So the environment was super important to us. But one thing I, I learned in doing radio is that the environmentalist and the Native Americans work side by side. And that is the only way we've got some things changed and accomplished is when we teamed up together because we are basically talking about the same thing, the same worry, you know, and we had solutions. We could come together and weave our solutions together to start making the changes that we need to make to save our planet. It's really basic, really, really basic. You got to hear Dana Lyons. He did a live stream concert. He has been traveling around for years with this message, you know, and he sings about just a drop of water, you know, it just, it's so profound, the place that we're in right now. And I'm scared, you know, I really am scared for what the future holds. So when you, when you showed up, you know, it was good timing because I was wondering, you know, how are we going to start? making this right again how are we going to pump the brakes on what's going on you know with our earth well i wanted to ask you about the classes that we're both participating in in new york city because in those classes or in that group that you that you spoke to you know the professors there are people from several different countries um people there now in those classes live in new york or new jersey or in that area you know which is a overbuilt urban environment and they're looking for a way not only to enhance their careers, you know, going forward if they're students, but to share information. But from the perspective of people in this urban corridor, and I think that's really interesting. I almost see buildings with windows open, little hands reaching out going, talk to us. You know, <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think there's a kind of, I don't know, I would say desperation, but also um, real hearted interest, you know, like they want to belong to the world outside, you know. Yeah. Like Natalie, who's a Trin from Trinidad, said to Howard that she can't wait to come to Port Angeles and visit. And she asked him if he had any recommendations of how she could get a NOAA job, you know, on one of the ships, you know, because that's her desire you know so you can see you know i went through this too because i lived in the city and i wanted to get out of there and go up to hell and i didn't know what i was going to do but i just wanted you know i knew that being in the city my entire life was not going to teach me much yeah i mean yeah. i've been there i've been there a lot and and so what would you say to people like that who are realizing maybe that there's something more than what they've grown up with or some vision you know or idea that's maybe something that they want to hear, you know, I mean, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, a vote. <laughs> <laughs> First thing. Yeah. Let's get, let, let's get past voting day, you know, with our fingers, toes, everything crossed. Um, you know, I just think if, if they're interested in helping make a change, you know, whether they're staying in their own neighborhood or wanting to make a big move and going to a place that needs some help right now. Um, it, I don't know, any kind of action that they can take, you know, making phone calls, talking to their own, you know, politicians in their own area. 
all of that's like really important. I mean, we can still do it on the phone. You know, we can still zoom. There's, I think this time that we're in right now, we're not, we're not um, stifled. You know, if anything, that door of communication is pretty wide open, even more so now. It's just so funny with Zoom. You know, it's like nobody really did this. You know, maybe once in a while and maybe it's in the corporate world and I just never was really that aware of it. You know, I would just say, you know, don't be afraid to try something new. You know, like I did blog talk radio. You know, it just takes a laptop and a cell phone and just getting people to call into my show and just start having the conversations about it. So I, I think it just depends on what people want to do, you know, at this point in their lives. I think personally, when this pandemic started, I was, I was floored. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what was going to happen next. And I'm, I've been furloughed from uh, a job. You know, I was working for housing and was with them for nine years. And then, uh, like I said, I took a break from radio, but I'm, I'm getting ready to get back into it again. I really think, you know, I need, even if I'm just hosting the show and everyone's calling in and talking to each other, I think we need to start doing that again. You know, we need to start talking to each other again, instead of having the TV and everything talk to us, you know, we need to be telling our own stories. We need to be doing our own problem solving. And I know with, uh, you know, get everybody's minds together and we're going to come up with some solutions here. So it, it, it does take a whole village, you know, to make the changes, not just one person, you know, even though there's some really powerful people going around on their own, like there are some young people out there I know, you know, that are standing up 12 years old and they got mm. the world's attention, you know, more power to them. And what's great about that is they create a following, you know, and they're taking that brave step. If you have to be the person, you know, that steps up, be that person, 